By 1941, it was becoming clear, particularly to Winston Churchill, that sabotage warfare was a viable option to the Allies in overcoming the Axis powers. It unfortunately had taken two years by this point for the War Cabinet to allow Churchill to authorise such missions. With the formation of the Special Operations Executive, the stage was set. One man who had spotted the potential and had the backing of Churchill was Brigadier Colin Gubbins, a stocky and stubborn Scotsman who was born in Japan but grew up in the Highlands of Scotland. The first mission was being conducted within weeks of Gubbins joining the organisation and was headquartered out of their new offices at Baker Street. Military intelligence had revealed a huge electrical transformer station at Pessac, close to Bordeaux in France. Pessac had been an early goal for the German invaders, whose commanders were quick to see the importance of the power station. Its eight transformers supplied power to the principal factories in the coastal area between Saint-Nazaire and Bayonne, Energy for the chemical manufacturers in the Nazi-occupied Bordeaux region, and most importantly for Gubbins, Pessac was supplying all the power for the massive German submarine base outside Bordeaux. If his men could knock out the transformer station, they would strike a crippling blow to German U-boat operations in the North Atlantic. An air attack on Pessac was initially considered, but quickly ruled out on the ground that aerial bombardment was highly inaccurate. The only other option was to parachute in a small team of saboteurs. They would have to find their way to the transformer station, scale the perimeter fence, dodge or kill the sentries, and then force entry into the main building. If they managed to get inside without being caught, they would need to locate the key components of the plant machinery and wire them with explosives. It sounded hard enough on paper, but there were additional obstacles. Intelligence believed that Pesak was on such an industrial scale and so important to the Nazi submarine campaign that it had been surrounded by a heavily fortified 16-foot tall wall and topped with barbed wire that was believed to be under 24-hour guard. Gubbins realised that an attack on Pesak could only be undertaken by French saboteurs. He therefore turned to his newly formed Free French Section and asked for volunteers for this operation, codenamed Josephine B. Gubbins initially handed over the planning of the mission to his colleagues Major Hugh Barry and Eric Piquet Wicks, head of the Free French Section. However, the duo's laissez-faire attitude to the mission gave Gubbins concern, so Cecil Clark was appointed to the task instead. The French volunteers arrived at Brickenbury Manor, in the spring of 1941, by which time Gubbins' team in London had discovered a great deal about the transformer station. Aerial reconnaissance photographs revealed the layout of the plant and position of the various buildings. They even showed the eight transformers. This information proved crucially important to Clark as he prepared to train the men. The transformer stations stood two miles from Pesak village in a heavily wooded countryside. This would afford the men good cover as they prepared themselves for the attack. The saboteurs would have to scale the wall without attracting the attention of any plant workers. Clark, owing to his engineering background, knew more than most people about transformers. They usually had thin steel casings that housed the winding machinery which contained oil used as a coolant. It was clear that the maximum damage would be inflicted by damaging the windings, letting out the oil and igniting it. If this was done, Pesak could conceivably be knocked out for six months or more. At 9pm on the 11th of May 1941, just a few weeks later, the team set off from Stratis Hall Aerodrome, flying to France in a specifically converted Whitley bomber. The team was nervous, as over the previous few days, the temperature had been dipping as low as minus 25 in the cockpits. The Pesak mission had been timed to coincide with the full moon, an important consideration for men being dropped blind into the French countryside. The equipment and explosives had been carefully packed into a rigid capsule. This too was to be parachuted from the plane. Clark had planned Operation Josephine B with surgical precision, intending it to be the antithesis of the sort of raid being undertaken by Bomber Command, who just 24 hours earlier had conducted its heaviest bombardment to date on Hamburg and Bremen, costing 11 bombers without any confirmation of successful hits. Clark and Gubbins were looking to prove that sabotage, at its best, was clinically precise. The men had been equipped with specialist weaponry, an automatic pistol, four grenades and fighting knives to be used against the German sentries if caught in close combat. They also had wire cutters, a compass, a torch, a rope ladder and of course, the limpet mines. The mission began like clockwork, the Whitley bomber reaching the Bordeaux area shortly after midnight and all three volunteers jumped into the night, closely followed by their precious metal container. They landed some five kilometres from the target area in Woodland but managed to avoid getting their parachutes snagged in any branches. They didn't locate the container until dawn, when they noticed it dangling in a tree. They hauled it down and then buried it, just as Cecil Clark instructed. The next phase of the plan was to conduct surveillance of Pesak. Their reconnaissance of Pesak brought both good and bad news. The transformer station was surrounded by a nine-foot concrete wall, lower than expected, 
but the wall itself was topped by a high tension wire that made its scaling almost impossible. There were also sentries on constant patrol inside the perimeter fence. Under specific orders that fire will not be opened unless the sentries interfere, it was inconceivable that the men could get inside the plant without a firefight that would almost certainly leave all three of them dead, so they postponed the attack until they could find a better way in. Displaying considerable bravery, one of the men named Sub-Lieutenant Raymond Kabar was selected to investigate the site more carefully. He walked up to the main gate and whilst chatting with the French sentry on duty, learned a crucial detail. The night sentries had become lax in their work and were in a habit of knocking off duty shortly before midnight. He also discovered that they slept in a billet in the northeast corner of the transformer station, leaving the main building unguarded from the west. Equipped with this knowledge, the saboteurs decided to attack on the following night, setting off from Bordeaux by bicycle under the cloak of darkness. With the team back in position by midnight, a quick reconnaissance confirmed the information about the sentries. Nobody was patrolling inside the site. Moving stealthily, the first team member followed a row of pylons to the small wood 300 yards west of the transformer station. He scaled the wall without the use of a ladder, swung himself over the high tension wire and clambered onto a pylon that stood just inside the perimeter fence. Jumping down onto the soft ground, he crept towards the main gate of the station, which he was able to unlatch from the inside. His fellow saboteurs entered in absolute silence, slipping through the dark shadows towards the transformer building. It was unlocked, and the men got inside without difficulty. The place was deserted. The workmen were asleep. The only sound was the low hum of the transformers. There was no light inside the factory, but the men's night training had not been in vain. They had no difficulty in locating the eight transformers, and it took just seconds to attach their limpet mines to each of the metal casings. During the whole period of half an hour in which the party were in the station, no one was seen and there was not the slightest interference. They had no intention of hanging around. As soon as the limpets were secure, they skipped back through the main gates, retrieved their bicycles from the dense woodlands close to the perimeter fence, and moved off. Suddenly, a series of hollow booms shook the stillness of the night. The booms were followed by resounding explosions and flames reaching to the sky. These flames could be seen towering more than 150 feet in the air. Seven other explosions were heard, all timed like clockwork. Cecil Clark's limpet mines had worked to perfection. The team later learned that the damage caused to Pesach was every bit as devastating as they'd hoped. Six out of the eight transformers had been crippled, cutting all power supplies to the German submarine base. The Germans immediately tried to restore power by rerouting electricity from the power station at Dax, some 70 miles to the south, but it merely resulted in blowing numerous fuses and this attempt had to be abandoned. The wreckage was on such a grand scale that it would take more than a year to repair the facility. The operation showed what could be done by a few gallant, well-trained men equipped with proper devices. The best news of all came when the three original saboteurs pitched up in England four months later in the third week of August after a daring escape across Spain and Portugal. Winston Churchill was informed that the scale of the destruction caused by eight small limpet mines strongly suggests that many industrial targets are more effectively attacked by special operation methods than by aerial bombardment fully justifying the existence of a dedicated sabotage unit as well as Cecil Clark's brick and training program. Little did they know, this was to be a huge turning point in history as a little-known commando captain called David Sterling had caught wind of the operation.